Hey, this is Jennifer Gonzalez welcoming you to episode 18 of the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. In this episode, I talked to Anthony Cody about how teachers can take an active role in changing the policies that impact their teaching. My understanding of educational policy is spotty at best, but it has gotten better since I started blogging two years ago because uh, I discovered pretty quickly that if you're going to put your opinion out there in the public, it better be based on some facts. And up until um, about a year and a half ago, um, I really only had my own limited world. I, uh, my experience with the Common Core was as a university instructor. I worked, I worked with um, pre-service teachers, and the Common Core was introduced to me as a new set of standards. I looked at them. Uh, they seemed fine. My state was an early adopter of them, so uh, I introduced them to my student teachers. I said, we're going to have to work these into your lesson plans now and help them, you know, learn them and get used to them, and that was pretty much it. And then a couple years down the line, I start to hear a whole lot of noise about them. And I honestly didn't really know what the problem was at first. Um, long story short, my uh, questioning of the whole situation eventually led me to someone named Diane Ravitch, who keeps a really incredible blog going. She updates it, I'd say, at minimum of 10 times a day, uh, where she basically just it's almost like a news feed on educational policy, on things that are going on right now. Um, she's a huge advocate for public schools. She's uh, pretty strongly anti-charter uh, schools, anti-corporate uh, takeover of public schools. I read her book called Reign of Error, which really was such an education on, on really what the big controversy is all about. And um, one of the people that also writes quite a bit on these issues is someone named Anthony Cody. He uh, kept a blog for uh, Education Week for six years called Living in Dialogue, and that's where he was writing primarily when I first met him online. And one thing that I really liked a lot about Anthony was that even though he was kind of moderating a lot of really heated discussions about issues that, that got people very, very emotional, Anytime I read what he was writing, he was always able to really handle things like such a gentleman, which is not easy to find. I, I found him very good at when he was faced with an opinion that might have been based on a lack of facts. He was very good at explaining the facts back to the person in a way that didn't necessarily always make them feel uh, embarrassed or defensive and really helped to educate them about whatever the issue was that they were talking about. So I've just really grown to respect Anthony's work quite a bit. And uh, so one of the things I had been thinking about lately as issues of school takeovers and testing and accountability measures and the Common Core just seem to keep growing and getting worse and teachers are feeling more and more powerless. These issues impact teachers almost more than anything else right now in in schools. And I feel privileged to have learned enough about the issues to at least have some idea of what's going on and maybe what people could do. But I feel like someone like Anthony, who now has his own blog, he has moved the Living in Dialogue blog over to its own entity. It's just livingindialogue.com. I feel like because he writes about this all the time and he maintains this, this blog, that he would be a good person to talk to about how ordinary teachers can start to become a little bit more involved. There are a lot of people who have basically made it their life's mission now to to fight some of these fights and try to change educational policy. But it seems to me that this group is not big enough yet and that there are a lot of teachers in the classrooms who might be able to do a little bit more, but they feel powerless. They, they don't know exactly what they could do. They fear for the safety of their jobs. And uh, also, they're just busy. There's just too much going on. There's too much to do. And there's not enough time necessarily to, uh, to get involved and to learn about all the finer details of the issue. So I asked Anthony if he would come um, on the podcast and 
talk to me about some things that that teachers can do to get started, to get involved. Maybe not get involved deeply, but what things they could do to start impacting some of these policies that are having such a negative impact on their own teaching. Before we listen to the interview, I would like to just stop for a moment and ask that if you have been a regular listener for a while and you're enjoying the interviews and information I've shared through this podcast, take a few minutes, go over to iTunes and give this podcast a rating. I have personally learned so much from the people I've interviewed for this show, and I would love for more people to benefit from them. Building up the reviews will really help put the show out in front of more listeners. So if you could give a review, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much. Now, here's my interview with Anthony Cody. Some of the questions that I'm going to ask you are things that I kind of already know the answer to. Sure. And others, I genuinely don't know the answers. And okay. I think that the people that I'm trying to help, I have this theory, and this is based on my own personality and my own experiences, and also based on people I know. Um, I think people can be very easily intimidated in conversations about policy and, and ed reform because they feel like they're going to very quickly be found out to be ignorant and look stupid and shamed for that. And so I'm, I'm mostly doing this for them, for, for people who really are frustrated with <laughs> their current situation, but just don't know and are intimidated by getting involved and don't know how to get involved and don't know what they can do and don't have time either to really dive in. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so a lot of my questions are going to be kind of coming from, from that perspective. Okay. Okay. So yeah. the main thing I wanted to, us to talk about are, are some of those specific actions they can take. But before we step into that, if, if you could, and this is partly for listeners outside the U.S. who might not be fully aware of what's been going on in this country for the last 10 years or so. Um, I do not expect you to give a 10 year summary, but if you could sort of give like an elevator speech of, of what's going on right now in this country and why are so many teachers um, really feeling so um, just so up in arms about the current status. Ever since No Child Left Behind, there's been a, a really concerted pressure on schools and teachers to produce results in the form of test scores. And um, then a uh, sort of a, an unfortunate bipartisan consensus that has shaped around the concept that uh, teachers are the most important variable in affecting student performance. This has led to a whole bunch of policies um, you know, I mentioned No Child Left Behind, which, which was designed to withhold federal funds from schools and school districts that, that fail to show constant improvement towards 100% towards proficiency. Mm -hmm. And then um, under the Obama administration, that morphed into Race to the Top and No Child Left Behind waivers, which added in accountability elements down to the individual teacher based on uh, the idea that teachers would have their evaluations uh, include test scores um, and that was one, that's been one of the requirements of the Obama administration over the last several years um, so now in lots of districts across the country in lots of states across the country we have uh, tests driving instruction even more and we have teachers jobs depending on students test scores um, in their evaluations depending on those test scores mm -hmm. so it's it's created sort of a pressure cooker uh, situation for teachers especially those who work in schools where the test scores are low where there's high poverty where there's English learners where there's uh, special education students um, these students tend to score lower on tests and don't perform according to the predictions that the uh, that the various uh, stati statisticians who create these value-added uh, systems um, you know they, they don't really they don't really work for some of these populations of students so if you happen to get um, 
you know, some special ed students or some English learners in your class or some, some kids with, in a high state of poverty or instability in their lives, then you're likely to see your, your student test scores drop. And the, the situation is that with these VAM models, um, you could be in the actually 20% of the teachers in the top quartile one year find themselves in the bottom quartile the next year. So these these systems are really unstable and and inaccurate at identifying who the good who good teachers are. Mm-hmm. Um, in around uh, 2010, we got this movie called uh, Wait for Super Waiting for Superman, and the big idea in this was that public schools are broken, that there's many many bad teachers out there, and that if we could just get rid of the bad teachers then our test scores would rise. And so that's, that's kind of what has led to a lot of this, um, this, this emphasis on um, evalu- teacher evaluation with the, with the goal being uh, ridding, the, ridding the classrooms of, of these bad teachers that are holding back our students. Let's, let's talk for a minute about value-added measures. Um, I have been reading your book, and I've been reading. Um, we'll we'll go into more depth about your book in a little while, but I've been reading a lot about the, sort of the myth, basically, of multiple measures, and that the idea is, and I think this is a, an initial argument. It was definitely the first thing I thought of when I heard that teacher evaluations would be based on test scores. I thought, well, if they could include them as a small component, it would make sense as long as a lot of other factors were considered. So what was your response to that? Because I think it, it was so interesting, yeah. the circularity of it. Well, there's, there's several big problems with, with this concept of multiple measures. Um, the biggest problem is that uh, in these systems are also being evaluated based on their tests, the test scores of the students in their schools. And the principals are handed the data about their teachers. And then, you know, usually in these multiple measures systems, uh, the other biggest component is the principal's observation and the principal's judgment. Mm -hmm. So here you have a principal who's been handed a list of the teachers that are performing, whose students are performing well. And he or she has been, that their evaluation depends on their, their aggregate students improving. And so then he's going into the classrooms of the teachers armed with this information of who's, who's produced good test scores and who's produced poor test scores. And that is expected to be another multiple measure independent of test scores. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's not independent of test mm-hmm. scores. Um, the, other, the other problem with the multiple measures idea is that the way that the other uh, metrics are chosen is, you know, there, there's a chapter in my book um, where actually um, Melinda Gates was, was on uh, Education Nation, and she was explaining this whole idea about multiple measures. And what she said is um, that the, the Gates Foundation funded something called the Measures of Effective Teaching, mm-hmm. and they researched other indicators to determine which ones correlated closely with uh, increases in test scores. <laughs> and, and so then that's what they call valid multiple measures. So basically you have the direct indicator and then you have some indirect indicators that are also correlated with high test scores. But any, any measures that didn't happen to correlate with high test scores, they didn't, they didn't consider to be valid. So there, there's... there's a way in which we define a good teacher as one who raises test scores. Yeah. And then we look for all sorts of indicators of, you know, secondary indicators of which teachers that will be to, to sort of corroborate the, the raw data that we're getting as far as that individual teacher's test scores. Um, so it ends up still the system revolves around those, uh, those test scores because they're determined to have measurable outputs. And that's what the whole system has to be ba- based on. Otherwise, it's invisible to, to these 
um, metrics people right. that want something measurable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's and that so that still is informing the behaviors of all of the schools. It's still putting. It's still the reason that when my kids go to school every day and take a computer class, all they're really doing in computer class is test prep. Yeah. Well. Everything. I was in a meeting a few years ago about an after-school program, and uh, they they said, "Well, we have to make sure that we are looking at our outputs. We have to make you know, this was this was supposed to be a recreational program, giving the kids a chance to you know to do sports or to do fun activities, to do theater, whatever." And these district people were bound and determined to to make sure that there was some uh, something that they could show would be justifiable on on the basis of improved test scores. So the kids ended up doing a lot of test prep in the after-school program, too. Yeah, so then they introduced some kind of test that the students (laughs) did. Okay, so before we move into the things teachers can actually do, the, the last area that I think is worth covering here is Common Core, because if there's any phrase that is included in a lot of protests and a lot of actions. It is Common Core. And this is actually how you and I first met basically online was that I was really just coming into it basically like a deer in the headlights saying, what's the problem? The Common Core standards seem fine to me uh, because I was only looking at the language of the English language arts, you know, Mm -hmm. 6 through 12 standards. And as a language arts teacher, they seemed like pretty, pretty well written standards. So that's when I started learning a whole lot more. I had never heard of Diane Ravitch at that point. I got introduced to this whole world. So I have a lot of sympathy for somebody who still asks that question. So if you could sort of summarize what exactly is everyone's beef with the Common Core? It's a, it's a really fascinating uh, subject because who you talk to, the, the beefs are very, it can be very different. Yes, um, I'm glad you and, mentioned and that. <laughs> and really, a lot of that has to do with where you are in the political spectrum, mm-hmm. what your relationship is to the classroom, and, and so on. Um, from my point of view, we came out of uh, eight years of No Child Left Behind or maybe even seven years, with it being hugely unpopular. The biggest applause lines during both Clinton and Obama's campaign trips were when they talked about, when they talked bad about No Child Left Behind. And people forget about that. But No Child Left Left Behind was hugely unpopular across the country by the time, uh, by 2008. So when Obama came into office, um, you know, Duncan said, No Child Left Behind is, you know, he called it something like brand. You know, the brand is is no good. We can't mm-hmm. call it that anymore. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, Common Core really was, was invented to, um, to allow high-stakes testing to continue under another name. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know... All of the all of the rhetoric about Common Core was really intended to provide a new, better model of high stakes testing. Um, if you look at the way that it was advertised from the start, that advertisement was really designed to to um, please people who were dissatisfied with No Child Left Behind. Mm-hmm. No Child Left Behind was all multiple choice tests. So with Common Core, we were going to get better tests. We were going to get tests that measured critical thinking. We were we were told, um, and this is has very little basis in truth, that teachers were consulted with the Common Core. Mm. We, you know, we were told that um, that it was that it was going to um, be you know be so much better. And you know, and a lot of teachers like yourself um, looked at the standards and thought, wow. There is some uh, some demand for critical thinking here. This does look better, mm-hmm. but the problem really really comes from from my point of view as an educator when you introduce the the management system yeah. attached to it. Mm-hmm. And you know, I don't know if you saw uh, Carol Burris's column just this week, taking taking uh, sharing some of the English language arts items. Oh um, no, I didn't. You should look at that okay. because um, 
the language in in some of these uh, English language arts tests. Here's here's a um, let me read to you uh, a, a sentence, and you guess what grade level this is appropriate for. Okay. Paradoxically, we posit that our fear of children being harmed by mostly harmless injuries may result in more fearful children and increased levels of psychopathology. <laughs> oh, I sure hope this is grade 11 or 12, but I have a feeling you're going to tell me it's not. No, that's, that's grade 8. Oh, goodness. Oh. So, you know, and this, this goes on all the way down. You know, she has a whole bunch of similar examples. Mm -hmm. where, you know, third graders are given sixth grade material, fifth graders are given eighth or ninth grade material. And, you know, and what, what we see as a result is that 70% 70 of the students who take these tests are rated not proficient. Right. And, and this is the real diabolical part of these standards because, you know, from the rhetoric of No Child Left Behind, we got this idea that, that we were going to try to try to reach every child and lift every child up. Yep. And with Common Core, we had very similar rhetoric about how we're going to make all students college and career ready. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the standardized tests have always been used to rank and sort students and determine who is eligible for opportunities and who is not. And so when 70% of the students are declared not proficient, basically those are the students who are being told you're not ready for a college mm. or career. And so I think I think there's a good reason that a lot of students are, are seeing that these standardized tests are not operating in their interests. And that's yeah. one of the main reasons that I think teachers are, are opting out as well as students. And then there is the there's the connection to since the standards were presented as hey, this is just a framework, all the teachers have got whatever freedoms they want to to implement these however they'd like, that has not, it wasn't predicted to be the reality and it has not turned out to be the reality in terms of curriculum actually being dictated. Well, you know, if you happen to be lucky enough to be in a, in a really privileged community where your students tend to perform really well on these tests anyway, mm -hmm. then you're going to find that you'll have pretty much a lot of freedom because your students are going to perform well, well on these tests. Mm -hmm. But um, the further you are from that, from that sort of uh, upper middle class ideal, the more you are going to be pressurized as an educator and your students are going to be pressurized as students. Um, and you're going to find yourself doing test prep. And that's what you'll see across the country. You'll see people adopting, you see people adopting programs uh, you see, student, you know, the school day lengthening so that students can stay on the computers and and drill, drill, drill. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole idea that um, that because these tests are measuring critical thinking, you cannot do test prep for them is nonsense. Because mm -hmm. people are doing test prep all the time for these tests, mm -hmm. and and it's a very narrow. You know, the whole what's what's interesting is. The way that we redefine a concept like creativity and critical thinking, you know, mm -hmm. when it is, when it is, um, when you have to put that thinking into a test, yeah, it really takes on a whole different appearance um, and a whole different meaning for the learner. Because if you or I were to think of some ways to measure students' creativity. I'm sure we would come up with some open-ended tasks and the students would come up with a lot of different answers because that's the whole point of creativity. Mm -hmm. But if you have to score their, their critical thinking on a test, then you, by, by definition, you're going to have to have convergent thinking. And you, you know, that's the sort of critical thinking that you're going to get is sort of which you know which of these half right answers is the is the one that the test creator was most likely to Ugh. thinking of you know right and that's, that's a very very narrow sort of critical thinking and it's a very authoritarian form of critical thinking as well mm -hmm. sort of like what do I need to do to stay out of trouble type of thinking yes <clears throat> now this all of these conditions have created, especially in some states, and I'm thinking of New York the most because it seems mm -hmm. like New York has got the high, 
most well-publicized, contentious relationship between, well, New Jersey too, I guess, but relationship mm-hmm. between its public school teachers and the state government, really. Yeah. Um, and so let, let's move into some of the things that, and, and I didn't, I don't want to pigeonhole it into New York, but I guess I'm just, just now finished reading about the robocall mm. um, campaign that's been going on in New York. Um, but I want to start off by just sort of opening up to whatever you were thinking in terms of what are some things that teachers who are unhappy about these conditions or even any other conditions who feel powerless, what are some things that they can do with some real steps they can start to take? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's important that they really inform themselves about what's going on. Um, and understand who are the players. What are what what is what are the agendas that are at work? Um, how are our unions being manipulated? How are we being manipulated? Um, how are our political leaders being manipulated uh, in variety of variety of different ways? Um, my book, The Educator and the Oligarch, is sort of a a primer on on the Gates Foundation's role in all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, that would, that would be kind of a, a good start as, as a, as a way to kind of grasp the, the, the spread of how these ideas and these policies have been, have been successfully introduced across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, um, once you've, once you've gotten informed, you know, then, it's you know it's really important that you not do anything alone you know that you look for other people that are like minded that you find other people that you can work with in your in your community or nationally mm-hmm. you know i'm up in a in a rural county in uh, northern california but i'm very connected to to activists all over the country so no matter where you are through the internet you can connect with other with other activists and and start, you know, start start expressing yourself. Um, mm-hmm. Start organizing. You know, um, there are people who are organizing within the NEA and the AFT. There are people in uh, non-union states that are organizing um, to to try to affect their state legislature. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a very active group in Indiana called. Northeast Indiana Friends of Public Education, which is just a group of about 10 or 15 people that, that some of them are retired teachers, some of them are active teachers, and they've been very effective at, at communicating um, statewide and with the state leg- lobbying the state legislature up there. Um, they were helpful in getting um, a national board certified teacher who's a librarian, a former librarian named Glenda Ritz as the superintendent of, of schools in the state. Um, Let's, you know, how did they, how did they do this? Were they, were, was there someone else sort of in line and they were able to, well, what, what things? happened was this was, that's an interesting case. Um, it was the state of Indiana, uh, which is a very conservative state mm-hmm. overall. And, um, the, the, uh, incumbent, uh, state superintendent of education was a guy named Tony Bennett, hmm. and he was uh, friendly with um, Jeb Bush, and mm-hmm. he was he was full fledged reformer, very pro Common Core. I think his his association with the Common Core may have hurt him because there's a lot of more libertarians in uh, in Indiana, okay. and okay. so the teachers uh, and parents who were really upset about all the high stakes testing were able to to really spread the word that that this guy was was you know was not listening to to the public and um, and she she ran a heck of a campaign and and they were they they actually got more votes than the governor got in winning she was the top statewide vote getter hmm. uh, and but unfortunately what's happened since then is the Republican-controlled legislature has, and and the governor, have done everything they could to uh, to limit her power, um, and uh, it's been it's been a big battle, um, 
because because the state you know the voters elected her to do her job and and basically since she doesn't go along with the uh, with the right wing outlook on education they they've they pretty much um, you know taken away a lot of her power but they were able to get her in and I'm thinking that there's got to be some piece of these types of successes even though it, it hasn't panned out well it's a step anyway <laughs> um, oh yeah it shows you know it shows that you can win against right. big money you know and there have been races in Los Angeles where where the candidate won against big money you know I mean Mayor de Blasio won against big money it doesn't it, the problem is getting somebody elected is you know like what happened in New York was de Blasio was was is a supporter of public education mm-hmm. uh, and there the big issue is that the charter schools have have been expanding and they take public school facilities and sometimes they'll share the facility but then they'll they'll kind of hog a lot of the resource resources Mm -hmm. and so when de blasio came in he tried to all he did was i think there was there was a proposal on the table for eight new charter facilities and he rejected three of the eight well the charter school supporters rallied uh hedge funders who immediately donated about three million dollars for tv ads and they ran these piteous TV ads with, with you know, children, big-eyed children staring at the screen. Why does Mayor de Blasio hate us, you know? Oh, no. <laughs> and, um, and he was forced to back down because, you know, they were just bashing him and he was, and he was taking a beating in the polls. So, you know, these, these uh, folks have a lot of resources and so, you know, we got to keep organizing, just like we saw, saw in Chicago, you know, where uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh-huh. again, had to pull out a lot of big money. But there's, you know, there, there's, there's a movement afoot, and um, I don't know when it's going to emerge into a full-fledged, national, coherent movement, you know. that's Part of the problem is that until you have something that people think can succeed mm-hmm. everybody remembers you know nader and gore and mm-hmm. nobody wants to waste their vote and see yeah. you know see see another supreme court get stacked again it's it seems like a big piece of this though has has to do with needing to shift the opinion of the public mm-hmm. and and this is this is one of the reasons i wanted us to do this is because Sometimes what I see on Twitter and in other, well, and on on Diane Ravitch's blog is I see almost what it, it appears to be the same circle of people talking to each sure. other, and not, and and there's there's almost a code in this conversation where p- basically everybody understands who we're referring to and what we're talking about. And if I talk about something that happened two years ago, everybody knows what I mean. And right. to try to bring in members of the public into that conversation, <clears throat> which I think is, is a big key to this, um, there has to be some way to stop talking to each other and start talking to them more. Yeah. Do you see any of that? I mean, I'm sure anytime someone says something in a public forum, then there's a greater chance of them reaching more members of the public. Yeah, well, you know, we're we're trying. I mean, I you know that was part of the reason I left Education Week was to try to create a more you know wide widely available or accessible forum for for people to read um, and to include video and so on. Yes. Um, but you know it's an uphill challenge when you know when our when our only sources of media are like blogs. <laughs> yeah. You know that mm-hmm. makes it that makes it difficult to reach a mass audience. Right. Um, the opt out thing has because it has thrown a monkey wrench into the works. That's created some opportunities for for some of our voices to be heard on the issue. Yes. Do you, uh, okay, you're talking about the opt-out movement in general or the specific situation in New York right now? Well, both. I mean, it is, okay. you know, New York, as you said, is kind of the most, the most um, obvious and, and extreme example of that. But there were also, 
you know, there were also student walkouts in, in Colorado and New Mexico and mm -hmm. um, other places around the country. So it isn't, it, is, it wasn't just a New York. So, so let's for the, because we're both, I'm um, doing exactly what I was saying happens too often is that everybody thinks that they, they're talking about something that obviously everybody already knows what this is. <laughs> what, what's been happening in, in, in New York in the last week or so with this robocall thing? Well, um, you know, I had a blog post on my blog a couple of weeks ago when, when a group, a grassroots group of people were raising money for a robocall. And I'm not sure if that's the same one that you're talking about. Um, or um, is this? It was, a, well, the, the post that I just saw was on April 11th, but I thought there was an uh -huh. update. But it was that, I guess, I guess an organization or maybe two separate organizations were robocalling parents to get them to opt right. their kids out of some test. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, I think it's the state test. Okay. Um, you know, the smarter balance test. Okay. And that's a yeah. common core based test. Yeah, that's a common core test. Okay. So, yeah, they they did a they raised, I don't know how much about 30 30 some thousand dollars to try to call every parent in the country. I'm sorry, in the state and urge them to opt out. And you know, I think that, that there were large numbers of parents and students planning to opt out anyway, um, based on the pattern from last year. Um, the students in New Mexico just, you know, I don't think anybody organized them. They just looked at what was happening. I don't know how they got the word, but they figured out, and they they were supposed to take the park test, and they could see that, that it wasn't, wasn't going to be in their interests. And so they walked out. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, the students in New Jersey um, the, and Newark, uh, the Newark Student Union, they've organized themselves and become highly uh, informed, very, very, you know, they have a very sharp understanding of, of what's happening in terms of uh, standardized testing and everything. So, um, so I think, you know, I think we're seeing as the tests roll out and as the results come back, people really uh, getting a sharper understanding of, of what's happening. If a teacher is, see, I can see a high school teacher sort of quietly nudging their students in that direction. And mm -hmm. I, I think there, there probably are a lot of teachers who would be uh, fearful for their jobs. Sure. Uh, when doing something like that, is that, is that just a risk they should, should take? Or is it... I guess well, I'm, what are how are people getting around that concern? Well, I don't think there's a there, there's, there's you can't really get around that concern. <laughs> you can you can either take the risk or you can not take the risk. Okay. Um, you can you can think about uh, there's ways to take the risk where you can make it less risky. You know, making sure that you have support from other parents or or from your community or from your from your union, um, but. You can't uh, you can't just pretend that there's no risk there, okay. um, and you know there's te there's people who are sort of confronting it in a public way where they're saying uh, I'm going to be I'm going to go to the school board and I'm going to declare to them that that um, I'm not going to give the test, and um, they're called teachers of conscience, and there's some of them. You know, there's, there were four in the city of Renton, which is near Seattle, uh -huh. in Washington. Um, there's some, you know, and there's some around the country. Um, and that's, you know, so that's, but on the other hand, there's also cases where teachers have been uh, suspended or fired even mm -hmm. for um, making a public, uh, for, you know, for declaring that they're not going to give the tests. It's not a decision to be taken lightly. Yeah. Do you have do you have other other examples of of teachers or, or districts that have maybe had um, s success, even if it's just small successes at their local level of of impacting policy? Well, you know, I think um, last year there was a really successful effort at Garfield High School in Seattle, mm -hmm. where uh, where the students and the teachers actually the teachers. It wasn't the it wasn't the annual test that they were that they boycotted, but they mm -hmm. basically declared that they were not going to administer um, a district mandated test called the MAP, mm -hmm. uh, 
it's the measures of academic progress. progress. And uh, this was supposed to be used to evaluate the teachers. You know, it was one of these computer adaptive tests. Mm -hmm. and, and the teachers really communicated well with, the, with one another. And they voted unanimously as a staff to, uh, to boycott the test. They got a lot of parent and student support. Um, and because of that, the district ended, first the district said that they were going to suspend them for 10 days without pay. Hmm. But ultimately, the district ended up doing nothing, and only a small fraction of the students took the tests. So, so that was a very successful su successful effort, and I think it sort of shows the way that that it's really important that teachers communicate clearly with with parents and students, so that because because the propaganda on the other side is that you know that. Teachers are, are objecting to these tests because we don't want to be held accountable. Right. And so it's really important that we that we develop the understanding among among the public that that we're not we're not worried about being held accountable. We're worried about arbitrary tests that actually hurt our hurt our students, um, and that are against our students' interests. And that's our primary primary motivation in in objecting to this it isn't it isn't because we're trying to save our skins right and that's the, you know that's the impression that i had i can remember that seattle protest that was one of the first times that i guess they got a lot of pictures of some of their their more public yeah activities and that to be honest that was my initial reaction um some of the people that i have taught with have been pretty pretty ineffective basically and mm -hmm. would really resist any attempts to, even just from within our school, to, to try something new. And I don't mean something, a new innovation from without. I just mean, why don't we try this? And their attitude was always just, these kids suck, you know, their parents don't care. I need to keep my lunch break. And it was just it, very a lot of very self-serving language that <clears throat> was not ever in the interest of the students. And I just happened to have taught with a lot of people like that. So... When I first saw those pictures of the people in Seattle, that's kind of what I thought, too, until I educated myself more about the issues. And, and Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we have a lot of work to do in terms of, of educating our colleagues and educating the public about how, how to really, you know, what does really high-quality assessment look like? You know, because I think I think we're getting this false this this illusion that these tests are rigorous. Yeah. And really, you know, these tests are the lowest common denominator of learning. You mm -hmm. know, and if we want genuine rigor, we should look at schools like the New York Performance Standards Consortium, where they have students do a, a really high quality portfolio that they have to defend before they graduate. Hmm. You know, students really have to produce high quality work they have to they have to show their competence that's a much more rigorous level of performance than uh, taking you know taking a one of these tests on the computer right um, and it's much better preparation for the real world yeah you know? so I'm gonna try to recap some of the stuff that we've talked about already um, one suggestion for someone who wants to start getting a little more active is to just get more informed, learn more about uh, the overall, the big picture, and then learn more about where the seats of power are in your, your own um, circles, your own district, your own state. Are there any centralized resources where a person who's really kind of clueless about who's in charge of what, you know, where would they begin to find out actually how these things happen at their own, in their own state or? Um. You know, there's Facebook has become a real way to network, and mm -hmm. so if if you're on Facebook, um, you can kind of snoop around and see see where the active people are and what what groups they belong to. Okay. Um, you know, different different areas. There's different groups that are that are very active. You know, in some areas, it might be a Save Our Schools group, it might be an opt out group, it might be uh, there might be Educators for Social Responsibility. There might be, um, you know, the Badass Teachers Association has state chapters. Okay. Uh, so those are all kind of networks to to kind of plug into. 
the Network for Public Education is holding our conference this coming weekend, um, April 25th, 26th in Chicago. We're going to be live streaming that. So you can you can see some of the workshops and some of the keynotes from that event. Um, Diane Ravitch is going to be interviewing Randy Weingarten and Lily Eskelson Garcia, uh -huh. the presidents of the um, AFT and NEA. Um, so that should be interesting on Sunday morning. Okay, that's going to be on stage and on stage interview. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That and does sound interesting. Five, yeah. Maybe, um, because this is still the, one of the first things that you're suggesting in terms of getting informed, maybe um, through email you and I can, can, I can work out a sort of nice list of links for people to sure. just start exploring in terms of all these different networks. Um, sure. That'll, that'll help with that. Okay, so getting informed is one. Uh, it sounds like some of the things you're telling me have to do with um, uh, is uh, opting out or, or pushing for mm -hmm. opt-outs is another avenue for sure. having an influence. Sure, uh, and there's a there's a national group called United Opt Out that has a lot of information okay. um, related to opt out. There's a group called Fair Test that has a lot of information about what's going on around the country. Um, they have a weekly bulletin that they send out that has uh, state by state sort of news updates about what's happening. Um, so um, that would those would both be good places to start. And of course, you know if you can. If there's, act, you know, if there, if it's possible to run for office in your local union, that's an avenue of activism as well. Or or go, you know, go to the rep assemblies. Um, there's always action there. Okay, good. Any other other suggestions for for a, a teacher or groups of teachers who want to start getting a little bit more involved before we move on to talk about your book? Um. You know, there's local school board races as well, and just think about you know what's happening in your community if that if that's possible to have an impact there. Um, some of the big corporate money is flowing into local school board races now, so it's very important that we that we support candidates that are that are willing to uh, defend public education. So let's before we close. Uh, you mentioned your book, but let's mention it again, The Educator and the Oligarch, and this was written last year, was published last fall, correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, why don't I just give you the floor to talk a little bit about what your book is? I'm about halfway through it right now, and I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Well, it's it's written to be very accessible. It's um, it's not, you know, it's not written in... in Academic or policy speak. It's it's written from the perspective of a classroom teacher because I I did teach in Oakland for eighteen years and um, really I discovered as you know as I got more active in education policy that that the Gates Foundation was really behind a lot of the bad initiatives, the reform initiatives that I was that I was finding most troublesome especially around promoting the use of high-stakes tests. And so I started investigating more, and the book really takes you into inside of how is it that the Gates Foundation has been so effective? Uh, how have they directed their money towards, towards think tanks, towards lobbying, towards sort of fomenting these astroturf groups that will, that will show up, have teachers who will show up at the, at the state uh, legislature to to testify uh, in support of laws that that strip them of due process, um, you know. And what what are the what are the that drive Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation's work, and what's wrong with them? Um, I think as you become active, it's really valuable to be able to articulate what's what's. What does really good work look like, and what what are what are the conditions we need to to defend and protect and and nurture good teaching, good learning, good good teacher professional growth? Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with this idea of using uh, student test scores to uh, to determine who's a good and who's a bad teacher? Um, so the book really really goes into into depth on on all of that and um, tries to tries to find uh, creative ways to poke holes in the in the 
in the arguments that that we hear so often from uh, from Arnie Duncan or Bill Gates or or any of the other um, paid representatives of of corporate reform. I think that's an interesting point that. It, it, so, it sounds like this is what you're saying, that if you're going to criticize something out there that is being offered as a solution, you need to be able to clearly identify what you think should be done instead. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully you've, <laughs> if you're a teacher, hopefully at some point in your career, you've experienced the the positive um aspects of working with your colleagues of of growing as a as a professional and um, you know really achieving insights into being a better teacher mm-hmm. and if you think about what were the circumstances that that surrounded that um, how can we how can we you know when, when I think when I when I go to writing about this I, I always go back to the work that I did at Bret Hart Middle School with my colleagues and the work that I did across the district in Oakland and how were we able to bring people together to look at their practice, to, to be self-critical, to, to really embrace new ideas. Um, and, you know, it isn't easy, but, but uh, you know, we have, we do understand, I, I think the idea that that the teaching profession has no clue about how to how to do this is completely is completely false. And there right. are some really great models out there um, that people have have done for years that have been very successful. And so we have to we have to you know really treasure those and highlight them and share them as as sort of alternatives to this top down um, measurement driven uh, profit driven competition driven model if you if you could sort of predict i guess uh if if everything went um the way that you would really like to see things going what 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 do you imagine could be the thing that really does change things for the better um whether it's a new candidate in office or well uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't see any of the new candidates. Mm. At least, none. Neither of the two primary uh, candidates that that we see, or you know, nobody on the Republican side, and I'm afraid nobody on the Democratic side. At least, we, we only have one. It looks mm-hmm. like. Um, I don't think she's very likely to uh, offer much hope in this dimension. Um, I think. Uh, I think there's two things. I think that. The opt-out movement shows the fragility of the testing system in that even more than most uh, most systems, it really repl- requires the active cooperation of millions and millions of students. Mm. And so to the extent that they become disenchanted with, with the system, they can very easily break it by, by simply withdrawing their cooperation. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's really positive. Um, I think the other, you know, I think the other thing to realize is just that um, education is a subset of our social, political, economic, um, you know, environment, and it's not a coincidence that corporate reform has been ascendant at the same time that wealth and power has accrued to the one percent or the top top tenth of the one percent. You know, those two things go hand in hand. And so, really, a reversal of corporate education reform will require some some fairly broad, broad-based social resistance to that control. And so, that's you know, I think teachers need to consider that and support and relate to a movement that you know that uh, challenges you know, Citizens United that challenges the corporate bribery in our, elect- in our electoral system, um, that challenges the concentration of wealth. Um, and because ultimately, as long as that wealth and power is, con- is so highly concentrated, um, teachers will find them- ourselves in the, same, uh, in the same lot as other working people, um, subject to decisions made by uh, powerful people with with lots of political power. 
I think we have a problem in our of paralysis because people do not see viable avenues for their for their activism, and so it's really important to offer organizations and and uh, avenues for grassroots activism because I think I think that's you know that's when people get uh, get feeling so the, the satisfaction that they're not simply powerless and subject to you know to complete control right. uh, but they can you know they can step up and and act act in concert with others anything else you want to add before we close um, no my blog is living in dialogue okay um, the national network that I work with is the network for public education and our website is Network for public education.org. What's your Twitter handle? So My Twitter is at Anthony Cody. Okay, all one word. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. This has been, all right. I really appreciate this. You're welcome. To learn more about how you can start actively influencing educational policy, go to cultofpedagogy.com, click podcast, and go to episode 18. You'll find a nice long list of resources and links to get you started. Thanks for listening and have a great day.